She's like a sickness in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and intoxicates Until the signals in my mind Forget to operate Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another Coffee and Crime Time. Now, just as a disclaimer, I do not watch family YouTube channels. I never have. I honestly am never going to. I find that there is something distinctly exploitative about recording your very young or even older children all day every day putting their private lives on display for anyone out there who wants to watch it's bizarre to me it's like parents are supposed to do the most to protect their children and these parents in my opinion are just doing the opposite most of these kids are not old enough to consent to this and even if they were many of them still wouldn't understand the long-term implications of having such a large internet presence. They can't really understand that once it's out there, it's always out there. And if they aren't the people making the ultimate decision of what makes the final edit, they might not even know what parts of their lives are being put out there. I usually find these channels, honestly, to be very uncomfortable to watch. The children sometimes seem unhappy or tense about being recorded, but also we have to remember they are kids who only know how to follow the lead of their parent or guardian right? They live in a home with their adult guardians and parents, and they are used to following the rules. They're used to being told what to do and following what their parents are saying. They haven't yet found their voice or learned how to communicate about boundaries. Many of these kids, I believe, don't even feel like they have the right to have boundaries, which is definitely the case in the Frankie family. So it often seems that the kids feel being on camera and performing for the world is something they have to do. It's just a part of their reality that they're forced to accept, even if they might not be 100% on board with it at all. And it just makes me feel really sad, so I just don't watch them. If you think I'm being judgy and I sound judgy, 100% I am. I'm very judgy about this, and that's just my opinion. You will not convince me that that these family vlog channels and people who are just like using their kids for content every day are good or wholesome or in some way, you know, putting something good out into the world, like you will not. So if you want to try, you can go ahead, but I promise you, you won't change my mind. So I don't watch these channels, but so, so, so many of you have requested that I talk about the recent arrest of Ruby Frankie of the Eight Passengers YouTube channel. And so I had to watch some of their content. I had to, a lot of it, honestly. And let me tell you, this woman, Ruby is horrendous. And within minutes of, you know, beginning to torture myself and hearing the things that she said and the way that she treated her children, I was quickly reminded of someone we know very well on this channel. We, we talked about often on this channel, and that's Lori Vallow. And trust me, the comparison is there. And then I read more about Ruby's arrest and the way she was behaving in the months leading up to it and the parallels between Ruby Frankie and Lori Vallow just kept growing. And for the occasion, I have donned my best Utah mom outfit, my best Utah mom knit casual, if you will, because this case once again brings us to Utah and the LDS church. And yeah, I know what you guys are going to say in the comments. It's always the LDS church. And like, I'm starting to agree with you. But like, I, I still stand on the fact that all Mormons are not like Ruby Frankie, are not like Lori Bello, are not like Josh Powell and his creepy ass father, Steve Powell. They're not all like that. I have a, I still have a really big issue with the generalizations besides saying that um, I believe all family vlog YouTube channels are horrendous. That is a generalization that I will stand by. So 41-year-old Ruby Frankie, Utah mother of six who rose to YouTube fame as a 
parenting expert, gaining millions of followers and making tons of money with her Channel 8 passengers, was arrested on August 30th, along with her business partner and friend, I guess, a woman named Jody Hildebrandt. We're going to talk about Jody. Trust. Jody's going to get hers in this video, too. Both women were charged with six counts of felony child abuse in regards to Ruby's 12-year-old son and 10-year-old daughter. And a lot of the reaction out there is, we saw this coming, right? People are saying we've been trying to shine a light on this for years because through watching Eight Passengers content on YouTube, I don't think anybody could say that it wasn't action-packed with red flags for days. So, as always, to understand what happened at the end, we have to go back to the beginning. But first, before we dive into this dumpster fire, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Surfshark VPN. If you, unlike Ruby Frankie, value your privacy and the privacy of your children on the internet, then Surfshark VPN is for you. Surfshark VPN secures your data with industry-leading encryption and the most secure VPN protocols, and Surfshark also provides IPS and DNS leak protection so that nobody can figure out where you're connecting from. I also love that unlike your internet service provider, Surfshark VPN has a strict no-logs policy, which means they aren't watching and recording what you're doing on the internet because you're a grown adult and it's no one's business. So what can you do better on the internet with Surfshark VPN? Well, you can do a lot. You can overcome location price-based discrimination on travel expenses like plane tickets and rental cars. If you're traveling internationally, you can log into a server in your home country so your bank account doesn't lock you out or freeze your account for security purposes. You can also feel safe on public Wi-Fi, which is something that I really don't often feel comfortable saying because Surfshark encrypts your data and makes it impossible to steal. And you can easily and quickly get around censorship and geo-blocking so that all the information you want is available, not just what whoever is making these decisions wants you to see. But Surfshark VPN isn't just about practicality and protection. They can also open up a whole new world of entertainment for you. Because with Surfshark VPN, you can unlock 15 of the largest Netflix country libraries, including the U.S. and Japan. All you have to do is connect to the server in the country that you want to view their content in, and off you go. Now, at this time, Surfshark has reached the coverage of 100 countries, and they're the only VPN to do so at this point, which is pretty great. Surfshark also is an app for every platform, PC, Mac, Linux, Android, iOS, Smart TVs, Amazon Fire Stick, Apple TV, Chrome, Firefox, Xbox, and PlayStation. And one subscription allows you to install and run Surfshark on an unlimited number of devices at once. So all of your tablets, laptops, your kids, PlayStations, Xboxes, things like that. So if they're playing a game live with other players, nobody can figure out where they're connecting from. There is just so much value in Surfshark VPN, and they think you'll agree as well, which is why they're giving you a 30-day money-back guarantee, and that gives you plenty of time to try it out risk-free. All you have to do is go to surfshark.deal slash Stephanie Harlow and use code Stephanie Harlow to get 83% off of a two-year plan plus three extra months for free. This is a great deal, and this special offer makes your subscription just $2.21 a month. Once again, go to surfshark.deal slash Stephanie Harlow and use code Stephanie Harlow to get 83% off a two-year subscription plus three extra months for free. And you can find links for this in the description box. Thank you so much to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring today's video. And let's dive in. Kevin and Ruby Frankie met in college when they were in their early 20s. They got married in the year 2000, and they went on to have six children together. Sherry, Chad, Abby, Julie, Russell, and Eve. The YouTube channel 8 Passengers started posting content in 2015, and at first, it looked as if they were posting basic family home videos. There was very little editing, and it didn't seem like Kevin Frankie, who at that time was a professor of civil engineering at BYU, he, it didn't seem like he had much to do with the channel. He would just pop into videos now and then. Mainly the videos included Ruby and her children and what they would do during an average day. When eight passengers began gaining a following, Ruby claims she saw this as a unique experience to, one, share Mormonism in a way that they normally wouldn't be able to do in Springville, Utah, and two, educate others on how to best parent their children. 
Ruby said, quote, It became apparent to me very quickly that people were interested in knowing how to respond to their children. It became, for me, a platform of teaching, demonstrating mothers in action, the powers of mothers, end quote. Which, uh, at face value, is not a wrong statement to make, right? I think that there are lots of people who value getting parenting advice from others, who value looking at other people's perspectives and seeing what they're doing that's working and trying to implement it into their own life. And I don't think there's anything wrong with showcasing mothers in action and the power of mothers. There is nothing wrong with these things on face value if that is what she genuinely meant and what she was genuinely trying to do, which I believe she was not genuinely trying to do that because she is one of the worst parents I've ever seen. On the YouTube channel, Ruby shared parenting advice and also showed certain interactions between herself and her children, but her audience soon became alarmed when some of Ruby's advice seemed a little extreme to say the least. For instance, she advocated withholding food from her children as punishment. She proudly told her viewers how she would take her children's cell phones, isolate her children from their friends, and even ban her children from their own rooms and their own beds. And many noticed that Ruby seemed to get off on this complete power, this complete control that she exerted over the six small humans living in her home. Eve is responsible for making her lunches in the morning and she actually told me she did pack a lunch. So the natural outcome is she's just going to need to be hungry. And hopefully, Hopefully nobody gives her food and nobody steps in and gives her a lunch. So in this clip, Ruby is explaining how her daughter Eve, who at that time was in kindergarten, forgot to make her own lunch that day, so she would just have to face the consequences of that, not making her own lunch in kindergarten, by not eating lunch during her, her school day. Later, when she came under fire for this, Ruby would claim that people were taking her out of context. She loves to claim that people are taking her out of context, by the way. And she said that Eve's school was like a 40-minute drive away, and so by the time she drove a lunch to Eve at the school, lunchtime would be over. But that does not really check out with the rest of what she said in that clip, which was hopefully no one gives Eve food or gives her a lunch. So it's not that you thought you would bring her food too late for the lunch hour. It's literally that you wanted your kindergarten age daughter to be punished for not making her own lunch, which she honestly shouldn't be anyways. And the punishment that you thought was appropriate was that she go hungry all day. And also, Ruby didn't just do this with Eve, right? So she's going to act like this is a one-time thing taken out of context. She did not just do this with Eve. She also did it with her son, Russell. To tell you this, honey, but unless you find a friend who's willing to share some of their food with you, I don't, I don't think you're going to be able to eat. But if you're not responsible for your lunch and your lunch money, that's the natural consequence. And I'm really sorry you're learning this the hard way. I will have a wonderful, yummy snack just hang in there today and and just make it make up your mind you're going to be really careful and make sure you grab your stuff when you go to school next time and maybe you have a, a good friend who will share some of their sandwich with you or something russell i'm really sorry he sounded like he was going to cry uh, he sounded like he was going to cry <laughs> How quaint, how funny, how cute. Maybe you have a really good friend who will share some of their sandwich with you, Russell, because you don't have a really good mom who will, A, remind you to bring your food or bring your lunch money, or B, bring you food or lunch money when you forgot it because kids are humans just like adults and they sometimes forget things. And the weird control issue that Ruby had with her children and when and what they were allowed to eat continued. Mom, can you give me some breakfast? You don't need food. Oh, yeah. Everything that comes into this house belongs to who? Yeah. Belongs to me. We're gonna go see Despicable Me 3. But before we do, I'm gonna make sure these kids have something good to eat. So, Boston, get in line. I'm first. Everyone get in line. Here we go. You get back there. So we're gonna go. I love that I can talk to my nephews that way. Get in line. Now go back to the back of the line. Get in line. Now go back to the back of the line. I'm not mad at you. I think it's funny. It's okay. Julie took five boxes of mac and cheese and took the mix and made it look like orange juice. I am asking you to make lunch for the family. Hey, do it with a happy face. 
<laughs> there you go. Thank you. Eve, jump in. Massage my back. Get rubbing. Okay, massage my back. Get scratching. Scratch my head. Come on, you gotta earn your keep. You don't get breakfast if you don't, if you don't massage my back. You're so mean. Oh, Carl. Get up there and scratch. Well, I guess you don't get food today. And I'll die to leave the house clean and my kids are literally starving. I hesitate to say this because it's gonna sound like I'm like a mean barbarian, but I told the kids, I said, I'm not even gonna let you eat breakfast until you get your chores done. I'm only gonna say it one more time and then you're gonna lose the privilege to eat dinner. You're gonna pass on the sucker. I've had enough brownie for a lifetime. <laughs> I really don't know. <laughs> Once you hit 99 pounds, you don't need any suckers anymore. You're too old, you're too big. And the, the family room was down a long flight of stairs and I put my, my two children, my almost six-year-old, she's probably five, and then um, Chad, my three, almost four-year-old, in the on a couch and I put on a movie. And I said, I am going to go lay down. Do not <laughs> move from your couch. You, you got your blanket, you've gone to the bathroom, um, the, the doors were locked and bolted, and I said, I'm gonna go lay down. I'm gonna lay your sister down for a nap, and the baby, and I'm gonna go lay down. And when I come down, uh, I will get some lunch for everybody or a snack or whatever it was. So they were fed, they were full, they were emptied. And, and so I thought, okay, everything's good. And I made it very clear. I said, do not under any circumstance go into the kitchen. Do not, do not go into the kitchen. You just stay right there and watch the movie for an hour. And I went upstairs and laid down. And an hour later I came downstairs and the movie was still going and they were sitting on the couch and they were cuddled in their blankets. I thought, oh, good. They did what they were told. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so relieved. Okay. So I went into the kitchen to start preparing some food. And as I walked on the floor, my feet went, they, they stuck, they stuck. I'm like, my foot is stuck to the floor. And as I lifted my foot up off the floor, it went like you could, you could hear the stickiness. I could hear it with my ears. I thought, oh my gosh, what is on this floor? And I took another step and my foot stuck and went like, it was like just sticking on the floor. And I thought, what is this? So I did what any mother would do. You know what I'm going to say, young moms? <laughs> I knelt down on the floor and I smelt it and I couldn't, I couldn't quite tell. And I <laughs> stuck my tongue out and I licked the floor. I'm like, oh. and I licked the floor. I'm like, this is pineapple juice. What in the world? How, how, how did pineapple juice get on the floor? And everywhere I walked, my foot stuck to the floor. And I thought, what, what, how? how I'm trying to put the pieces together. Like what happened? So I called my two kids and I said, I said, come here. And they came over and I said, do you guys know why this floor is sticky? No, 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 we don't know. And I said, I, this floor was absolutely clean before I went upstairs. I went upstairs for an hour and I came down and now it is covered, covered. There is something that's going on. And one of you or both of you, know something and you're not telling me. And I'm gonna stand here until you do. For some context in that last clip, uh, Ruby's referring to her two oldest children, Chad and Sherry. And this was a time when they were very young, so clearly her bizarre controlling and threatening behavior didn't start when she began posting videos on YouTube. That's just what drew the world's attention to it. Also, if you notice, she treats her children like servants, like they are just little people in her house there to serve her. And then she uses food as a way of, I guess, getting them to do what she wants them to do. And there's so many more clips of this out there on the Internet. Like there's a clip where she's saying that she made her two kids come home and like scrub the floors and stuff. And I don't really want to get started on the fact that Ruby said there was something sticky on the floor, like, and she couldn't figure out what it was, so she touched it and she smelled it, and then she licked it. I mean, you you do you think it's a joke? I don't know what's happening here. I don't know what's wrong with her, and I don't know why she has this insistence of holding everything over her children's heads. So here is a clip where her oldest son, Chad, is explaining how he wasn't allowed to sleep in his own bed for seven months. My bedroom was taken away for seven months and then you give it back like a couple weeks ago. I don't think our viewers know that. You've been sleeping on a beanbag. I've been sleeping on a beanbag since October. <laughs> and they 
give my room back like two weeks ago. Oh, I'll give yes. you the reason why I lost my bedroom. I think so. I think this is the reason. At least this is the reason that's in my head. It's so, pretty funny, but now that I look back, I mean, it's pretty depressing. No, we never told our viewers. That I woke Russell up at 2 in the morning and told him that we're going to Disneyland and he has to pack. <laughs> and he got up and made his bed all neatly and then packed all his clothes in a suitcase. And then he walked out the door and I'm like, Russell, and he's like, what? And he's all happy. <laughs> has his sunglasses on. Do you think it's funny? Because... And then I walk out and... If you think it's funny, then you... That was seven months ago. Maybe you need longer without a bedroom. It... It was not funny. <laughs> Russell got the big bedroom and Chai got the the smaller bedroom. Smaller. And Russell's bigger bedroom also had a bathroom. But what you guys didn't know was <laughs> Chad didn't get any room. Mm -hmm. He didn't he didn't get anything. He was sleeping on the floor in the family room. <laughs> So Ruby Frankie seems both entertained by Chad's recollection of these events as well as smug and pleased with herself as if she really did something there. Now apparently taking his room away for seven months, this was a reaction to a simple prank that Chad played on his younger brother waking him up in the middle of the night and telling him that they were going to Disneyland. The fact that Ruby Frankie seems to believe that this is a very normal reaction to a stupid prank between siblings and she's bragging about it on camera lets you know the lack of self-awareness that we're working with here. And Chad says in this clip like, he clearly didn't even know why he was being punished in this extreme way. He was like, I think it's because of this, right? I think. But clearly he was never told he was just punished without any understanding of why he was being punished, which if you're a parent and you are going to punish your kid, you would probably tell them why they were being punished. If it's not just this sadistic thing that you're doing to them, you'd tell them why so that they would know and that they could learn from it, right? And Chad says in this clip, it was depressing. He's clearly upset by it, which I mean, I think any one of us would be, right? If that happened to us, if we were forced out of our room and made to sleep on a beanbag, a small beanbag in the living room, we probably would find that to be disruptive to our mental state. But he just doesn't feel like he can be upset about it because then she pops in. As soon as he starts expressing his self and how he feels about the situation, she pops in. She's like, do you think this is funny? Because if you think it's funny, maybe you didn't lose your room for long enough. And he's like, no, 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 it's not funny. Like, please don't do that to me again. And Ruby Frankie also liked to let her children know that she was in charge of everything of what her children were able to do, of who they were able to see and talk to. And she reminded them of this often when she would take away their cell phones and not allow them to socialize with other children their own age or pretty much anyone. Abby, we took the phone away from Abby in November. Um, in November. Oh, and and you, may, you may never get the phone back. Probably not. No, I have no friends. You can play with friends. No, like I don't have friends. I don't have friends either. I literally like told my friends I'm not hanging out with them anymore. Because, because they're they like, say some pretty messed up stuff. Um, I don't even know where they live. They're pretty far away. So, summer goal, become the best athlete I possibly can. Because I really won't get anything for summer. I won't be able to go anywhere. No, I don't have any friends. No iPads, no TV, nothing. Everybody's asking if you still have your phone taken away for the summer. <laughs> yep, I do. Yes. Sadly. And... It's not her fault, it's mine. When will you learn, Chad? A lot of actions have consequences. A lot of you guys say, oh, you shouldn't get mad at him for bad grades. They try their hardest. You on the I other did not hand, try my hardest. Don't know that he Cheat on a tried his hardest. Is that just and I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg. The Eight Passengers YouTube content also consisted of moments that should have been private for these kids, such as Abby and Julie's first time shaving, doctor's appointments, puberty talks, etc. And Ruby audaciously put out videos of her absolutely traumatizing her young children, marketing it as entertainment. If you cut one more thing in my house... <laughs> I'm going to take the scissors, look at me, and I'm going to cut its head off. Grandma will be so mad! So what are you going to do? Are you going to cut anything else? No. You promise? 
It's really difficult to see a small, innocent child filled with the joy that only youth can bring being actively broken down in front of your eyes. You could hear when Ruby first started talking with the bear in her hands, there were giggles. The kids thought she was being silly, you know, like playing around. And as soon as she threatened to cut off the head of this stuffed animal, which was clearly a valued toy for her daughter, the little girl broke down into tears. This bitch, Ruby Frankie, needed someone to punch her in the face and humble her a bit, which is ironic because being humble and having humility will soon become a huge talking point for Ruby, although I do not believe she ever, 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 ever understood the definition of what humility actually is. Because if it's anything that Ruby Frankie has, it's not humility. If it's any uh, character traits or um, personality traits that she exhibited, humility was never one of them. At the end of the day, oldest son Chad seemed to be getting the brunt of his mother's aggressive parenting techniques. In 2019, before his bed was taken away from him for seven months, Ruby and Kevin Frankie sent Chad to a wilderness camp called Anasazi, which is reportedly a behavioral program for adolescents aged 12 to 17 who are struggling with a variety of things, most of which are typical teenage things to struggle with, such as depression, anxiety, self-image issues, defiance science, family conflict, mental health, lack of motivation, drug and alcohol, internet addiction, entitlement issues, and quote-unquote other self-defeating behaviors. And it appears that the person who suggested Chad be sent to this camp was a woman who'd been counseling him, a woman named Jody Hildebrandt. And like I said, we're going to talk about her in a minute. So Chad had clearly not learned his lesson after spending almost 10 weeks at this camp because he pulled that horrible prank, that horrible, unacceptable prank on his little brother a month after getting home, which led to him sleeping on a small beanbag chair in the living room for over half a year after he was probably made to sleep on, like, the ground in some weird backwoods wilderness camp for 10 weeks. So when they received backlash for sending Chad to this place and for taking away his bed, Ruby and Kevin Frankie doubled down with Kevin stating, quote, we need to face hardships and pain to develop resilience and grit. That's what leads to success in life. If we make things easy on our kids all the time, they're going to grow up to be snowflakes, end quote. <laughs> Once again, I do not disagree that we shouldn't make things easy on our kids all the time. They, they eventually have to learn that there's obstacles in the world and they have to be taught how to handle those on their own. But I don't think that taking your child's bed away from them for seven months is once again an acceptable sort of reaction to what he did. It just really isn't. But keep in mind, by this time, Jody Hildebrandt was involved in the Frankie's life. She was involved with counseling Chad. And based on what we'll come to find out about her, I have no doubt that she was filling Ruby and Kevin's head with all sorts of things that Chad was going to, you know, end up in trouble. He was going down the wrong path. If they didn't step in and do something drastic now he was going to end up in prison, right? And his mom, Ruby Frankie, actually says something like this in a video. She's like, oh, you know, he was headed down the wrong path. He was going to be he was going to be in prison. He was going to end up behind bars. So it, there definitely seems to be the influence of Jody Hildebrandt on the Frankie family by this point. Towards the end of Eight Passengers Reign on YouTube, this is how Chad Frankie seemed to be doing. For joining our yoga session, and our stretching session. I really hope you enjoyed this and learned something. Please subscribe and I know you can't comment below, but um, please like the video and I, and I hope you learned something and I, yeah, have, have a nice day. He seems to be really filled with resilience and grit, right? Or does he seem completely broken? And just as, you know, an aside here, abusing your kids breaking them like this, completely eliminating and destroying their self-worth or any sense of autonomy that they have, 
crushing the spirit in them, that is a better predictor of whether or not Chad is going to end up in prison than him just being a normal rebellious teenager, cheating on a test, playing pranks on his brother, maybe not doing the best as far as grades go in school. This, what his parents did to him, is a much better predictor of turning him into somebody who has no self-worth and will go on to repeat this toxic cycle of abuse, whether it be on his own children, on his partners, on himself. So yeah, if they wanted Chad to not end up in prison and not end up on the wrong path, they certainly seemed to be throwing his ass down the wrong path. However, from 2015 on, eight passengers continued to grow at a rapid pace, boasting over 1 million subscribers by 2019 and attracting big name sponsorship deals with companies like Clorox and Sargento. When other YouTube creators began making videos about the eight passengers YouTube channel and how toxic they were, the exposure at first seemed to only draw more attention to the Frankie family and their subscriber count shot up to 2.5 million. But by the spring of 2020, subscriber numbers had flatlined and view counts on each eight passenger's video were declining as more and more people began to notice the abusive behavior on behalf of Ruby Frankie towards her children. In 2020, CPS visited the Frankie home in Springville, Utah, responding to several complaints of abuse and neglect, but no charges were ever filed. According to Ruby, <laughs> the CPS officers were so impressed with her parenting skills after being in her home and seeing her interact with her children, that they allegedly asked her for tips before leaving, and they told her they were going to go home and make some changes on how they were parenting their own children. Th this is one of those stories that I just don't believe. I just don't believe it. There may not have been enough to prove that she was neglecting her children because CPS, she's not going to do it while CPS is there, right? But I doubt that these people were like, whoa, we're so impressed by the iron fist you rule your household with. We are going to go home and put our kids on a beanbag chair in the living room, too. So once other creators started making videos exposing them, once some of their viewers began calling CPS, Ruby Frankie took to the media to talk about how this was an attack on herself and her family and a clear example of cancel culture at work. She said, quote, The reason we got canceled was because I was demonstrating, as I have done from day one, what a responsible mother looks like. And it scared the living bejesus out of these kids who do not want to be held accountable. So that was the motive for the hate being thrown at me. I'm the antidote to their acting out, and they know it, end quote. So humble. Like, this statement is oozing with humility. I just like, I'm going to go home and enact this type of humility in my own life now that I've seen Ruby do it. In, in real time. So apparently, Ruby believed anybody who was a detractor of hers, they were not the normal, average, intelligent person. They were a small but social media savvy gang of teenagers who were twisting her content out of context to aid in their campaign to destroy her channel and get it banned because they were threatened and terrified of her tough love approach to parenting. And they thought that maybe their own parents might stumble across an eight passengers video and start getting ideas in their heads, start holding them accountable for their behavior. And then these wily, ill men and her teens couldn't allow that to happen, so they had to remove any trace of Ruby Frankie from the internet in their own selfish and ignorant interests of self-preservation. Obviously, this is completely delusional, and I can't say for sure that there weren't some angry teens involved in the very large and loud group that began to speak out against eight passengers, but this is an example of the way Ruby Frankie will twist the facts to suit her own narrative to allow herself to continue on with her methods and to block any outside criticism that might cause her to self-reflect and look in the mirror, right? These are not normal people coming at me. These are teenagers, social media savvy teenagers who just want to destroy me because I represent everything that they hate. I'm the antidote. <laughs> the massive backlash that was being brought to the Frankie's front door caused companies who were paying eight passengers to advertise certain products to back away and distance themselves from the family vlog channel. And Ruby spoke about this during one interview saying, quote, sponsorships were 90% of our business and that has gone away. I never cease to be amazed at how intense and ferocious these individuals in the cancel mobs are. They will watch your videos for two hours straight to take note of every ad that pops up and reach out to every one of those 
those advertisers and threaten them with boycotts, end quote. And this is bullshit because this has happened to me. It wasn't subscribers who were calling and like, you know, threatening my sponsors with boycotts. It was members of a certain church, a.k.a. cult, who when I started talking about their cult got mad, wanted to silence me and wanted to basically cut off my financial means. And they called all my sponsors because all my sponsors let me know. However, the people who work at these companies who are sponsoring my channel are intelligent and they watch my content and they knew what was going on. They knew that I wasn't doing anything wrong because they watched my content. And I have a sneaking suspicion that the companies who distance themselves from eight passengers also went on and watched Ruby Frankie's content and they were like, ah, I see. These people have a point, right? These people definitely have a point. So sponsorships aren't just going to withdraw from you simply because they're getting pressure. They're going to withdraw from you if your behavior or things that you're saying or doing is brought to their attention. They look into it themselves and they realize it is problematic and so they don't want to be affiliated with you for the most part. I'm sure there's exceptions to every rule. By 2020, people began to notice that videos were being deleted off the Eight Passengers YouTube channel, and Ruby had ceased posting basically any content at all. So after the CPS visit back in 2020, she had taken a short break from putting up videos, but the channel returned to daily posting throughout 2020. However, by 2021, a video was going up only every other day, and by the end of August, there was no consistent posting schedule, and subscribers were seeing maybe a handful of new videos each month. On January 2nd, 2022, eight passengers posted a video about Eve's baptism, and then there was nothing after that. And Ruby sort of explains why she stopped posting on YouTube in this clip here. I've been full-time. You wonder where I've been on my vlogs? You wonder why I left YouTube? It's to save my kids. No amount of money. I, and I'm telling you, I was making millions and I left it because my kids were being hurt. With entitlement, they were being hurt. With people's advice, and they didn't have a mother up the front saying, I don't care what the world's opinion is, this is the truth and this is where I stand. And fortunately, I had a chance, I had them in my home long enough to do it and I'm not gonna lose them. They're seeing truth, they're accepting truth, they're loving truth. And so this is my passion, is to invite you to stand in truth and put your opinions to the side for a minute. Because your kids are the target of distortion. Okay, there's a lot to unpack here. First of all, gotta love the, uh, the fake Aaron Patterson tears. But also, the person that Ruby Frankie is sitting next to is Jody Hildebrandt. And like I said, I'm going to explain who she is really soon. But I watched this clip multiple times. A few of the times I focused on Ruby and what she was saying. And then after that, I focused on Jody and what she was doing and how she was reacting. And she's doing a lot of nodding while Ruby talks. But her expression on her face also gives me the distinct feeling that this was something they had rehearsed before. And Jody was nodding along as in like, yep, you hit that point. Yep, you hit that point. Good. That's that's exactly what we said to say. That's what we talked about. Yep, perfect, perfect. Oh, you nailed that one, right? Um, th neither of these women, I believe, is crying in this video, but they're using emotion as a way to uh, motivate their viewers to believe what they're saying more, right? If they just said it straight-faced and they didn't like add all of this extraneous emotion into it, people are not going to be as affected and they realize this. So also, let's talk about how Ruby Frankie said that she lost all this money, you know, because it was more important to take care of her kids than to make millions. No, bitch. You did not stop posting on YouTube because despite making millions, you really just were concerned about your kids and you wanted to quote unquote save them. You stopped posting because you couldn't be monetized by YouTube because family channels can't be anymore. And that was right around the time, I believe, where they made that change. And all of your sponsors got chased away by your viewers and by your views. So you weren't actually making millions. There's no way that if you were making millions, you would have stopped posting. And when you were making money, you had very little care for how much your children were being hurt. And they weren't being hurt by advice from viewers, 
or advice from other sources, they were being hurt by their own mother, which she illustrated multiple times. Lastly, we hear some buzzwords and phrases that Ruby Frankie is using in this video. Buzzwords and phrases that Ruby and her little friend Jody Hildebrandt love to use. Entitlement, distortion, stand in truth, etc. Ruby would announce that the reason she was pulling away from YouTube was because she'd found her true passion, which was getting involved with the mental health community and acting as a life coach with Jody Hildebrandt's company, Connections. Now, I know it's pronounced Connections, but since they have it spelled with an uppercase X, my brain reads it as Connections. And I can't stop from doing that. I can't stop what my brain does. These stupid companies think that like throwing an X into their name will just immediately make them unique and different and stand out. And it does stand out like a sore thumb to my poor brain. So let's talk about Jody Hildebrandt and Connections. Jody Hildebrandt claims to be an author, life coach, and the founder and creator of the Connections Classroom based in Orem, Utah. Before I continue, let me just say, I believe that this Connections thing is a cult. If it looks like a cult, if it sounds like a cult, if it walks like a cult, it's usually a cult. And similar to Lori Vallow and her preparing a people group, this is a cult. Allegedly, but not really. And come for me if you want. I found a website that talks about Jody and um, and her her company, and it says that the core teachings of connections is that for a person to achieve true connection with another human being, they must not be in distortion. Well, what is distortion? Apparently, distortion is a broad term defined by Jody. By taking the course co that connections offers, people can learn they are in distortion by being addicted, whether that be to work, shopping, electronics exercise, eating, drugs, sex, pornography, etc. You know, Jody says the list of things that people can be addicted to are endless, like cults. They can be addicted to this weird sense of security that a cult provides, for instance. You can also be living in distortion if you're living in shame and denial, if you know you're not enough, if you're codependent in your relationships, if you're living in lust, or if you're being controlling and manipulative of others, which can I just say is ironic because as we come to find no one is more controlling and manipulative with others than Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildebrandt. So I guess they're in distortion. Jody also asserts that everyone is in distortion, right? They all experience these things, but she can help you overcome distortion and live in truth. And truth is spelled with a capital T, even though it's not at the beginning of the sentence. It's kind of like God, right? How God is always spelled with a capital G, even if it's not at the beginning of a sentence. Truth, they always spell it with a capital T at Connections, which means that I think that they, they consider truth to be this godly thing, this all-encompassing, omnipotent thing that is objective. It's completely objective based on what they think it to be. So Jody teaches that three core principles must be developed in order to truly connect with anyone and to avoid distortion. If you or others do not practice these principles, which are impeccable honesty, rigorous personal responsibility and humility, you are considered to be in distortion. And Jody thinks you should also distance yourself from people who are in distortion so you're not drawn into it with them. Now, this website, which is jodyhildebrandt.com, says, quote, Jody often remarks that and relishes the fact that people either love me or hate me for what I'm teaching. The people that her teachings are being applied to usually hate her. They are told they are emotionally and verbally abusive, an addict of all kinds of things, in distortion, not humble, etc. These people say that their loved ones who attend Jody's courses, whether that be their friend or spouse or family member, changed within a few weeks. And unless they too are willing to apply Jody's principles and change as well, they will be cut off. So it sounds like a cult, right? <laughs> it sounds like a cult. Don't cults like just completely isolate you from friends, family, loved ones so that your only influence is the cult? Just saying. Jody Hildebrandt does appear to have a master's degree in educational psychology, and she is licensed in the state of Utah as a professional counselor, but her license was put on probation by the Utah Clinical Mental Health Counselor Licensing Board for 18 months in January of 2012 after she was accused of discussing a patient with his LDS church leaders as well as people at Brigham Young University. Now, at that time, Jody was the director of Lifestar Utah County, a franchise of a national company that specializes in pornography 
pornography and sexual addictions. And the allegations state that in 2008, Jody was providing marriage therapy to a couple and the male counterpart of this couple, who's referred to only as John Doe in these court papers, he claimed that Jody continually accused him of being addicted to pornography, even though he denies this and he says this was not a problem that he and his wife had come in to discuss to begin with. John Doe said, quote, she spent hardly any time knowing about my life. She didn't want to talk about my personal goals or progress. She would only threaten me that if I didn't take more sessions and have my wife take more sessions, the alleged addiction would destroy my life, end quote. This man said he does not have addiction issues, and once he began to question Jody's therapy methods, which were costing him between $1,200 to $2,000 a month, by the way, his personal life began to unravel. He said Jody started discussing his private and sensitive information without his permission multiple times with their LDS church and administrators at BYU, and this included a medical diagnosis, which once again, John Doe did not believe was accurate. So it almost seemed like John Doe was saying, you know, I don't think you're helping me and I don't want to pay all of this money anymore. And Jody was like, you have to or or you're going to be like in, in trouble, you know, like your marriage isn't going to work. You're going to be living in distortion forever, like your life's going to suck. And he was like, yeah, I really don't feel like I'm getting anything out of this. And in order to punish him or blackmail him or to basically like extort him she started talking about his private information with people he knew in real life, which, I mean, any mental health professional would know that is a huge no-go. Like, that is the biggest break of trust that a patient can have with their mental health expert that they're working with. It's unacceptable. And honestly, I think her license should have been completely pulled, not just put on probation. Ruby Frankie was brought into Connections by Jody and then trained to be a life coach. And no offense to any people out there who, you know, consider themselves to be life coaches, because I'm sure you are like actively helping people and your intentions are good. But a life coach essentially means that Ruby Frankie was an unlicensed person who was claiming to be able to provide counseling and therapy to others without being held to any of the laws and restrictions that mental health professionals are required to abide to, like HIPAA. For a while, both Ruby and Kevin Frankie basically became the face of Connections, with both of them actively participating in conferences and podcasts and talking about the company. But Ruby would eventually become totally entrenched with Jody Hildebrandt and Connections, right? And they're always preaching a against codependency, but that's exactly what they foster at this place, okay? Exactly what they foster is codependency. Codependency amongst themselves and codependency of the people who attend these classes to Jody Hildebrand. And after Ruby kind of got really deep into Connections, she reportedly began distancing herself from her family and friends, including her siblings, her parents, her children, even her husband, who reportedly moved out of the family home sometime in, I think, early 2022. And there were rumors that when Kevin left, Jody moved in. We're going to talk a little bit more about this later. Around that same time, though, Ruby's two oldest children, Chad and Sherry, also left the house. Chad just moved out because he couldn't take it anymore. Sherry Sherry is a student at BYU. She reportedly cut all ties with her family. And this was something she confirmed on Instagram, where she stated that she did not agree with the extreme beliefs of connections. And she claimed many people were working on straightening out the situation with her family. And she had hoped that they would one day be whole again. And that brings us to what these extreme beliefs of connections were. And as it turns out, they appear to be even more drastic than the parenting advice Ruby had been doling out on eight passengers. Many of these beliefs were discussed on the Facebook group that Jody and Ruby had created called Moms of Truth. And I couldn't get into the group because you have to be accepted by the moderators and those people are currently behind bars. <laughs> Thank God for that. But I was able to find some clips that illustrated the kinds of things these two women were talking about on YouTube, on Facebook, and in their podcast. Hello and welcome to Moms of Truth with Jody and Ruby. I'm Jody Hildebrandt. Welcome to our group. We are so honored that you are here with us. We have such a desire to teach principles of truth and most importantly, help you understand how to use your agency to use these principles in every experience of your life. So we were not aware of how quickly we'd grow. <laughs> we were getting one, two, three people, and then boom, it opened up and we're getting thousands of people. We had 700 people come in just in one day and we are so thrilled. And we didn't know that once we opened the gates of heaven, 
that the gates of hell would follow. And what I mean by that is distortion. Where truth is, distortion shows up because distortion is at battle with truth. You all know that. So welcome to the battlefield. Okay, so that's Jody Hildebrandt. I mean, this chick Jody is just so dramatic, man. So dramatic. But you can hear, once again, the language she's using, the buzzwords, truth and distortion, which is just another way of saying good versus evil, right? She presents it in this way, as most cults do. We are in the right. We have God on our side. We have truth on our side. And the world is going to try to test you and take you down because they don't have our truth. They don't have God on their side. The devil has sent these demons to tempt you to the dark side. But we are going to fight. And if you fight with us, if we stand side by side together, you too can have God on your side. You too can have the truth with a capital T on your side. And we will prevail. Welcome to the battle for your very soul. I'm thrilled that I can link arms with my brothers and sisters and go and fight distortion with principles of truth. So here's what you can expect from us. Our job is to educate you about what the truth is as far as principles of truth. Now, some people are coming in and like, I know what truth is, and they will not listen. They will not listen. I have spent hours texting people saying, you're not hearing me. Help, here's what I want you to understand. And they, they won't humble. So here, here's the deal. I always find it incredibly condescending when one grown-ass person tells another grown-ass person that they need to be taught something. And the way that Jody poses this is like, you don't know what's going on in this world, but I do. And if you stop being so ignorant and stubborn, I'll teach you. But the question would logically follow, like, how do you, Jody, know the truth, but I don't? How do you know that you know the truth? And how do you know that I do not? Like, what makes your truth more truthful than my truth? And what makes you the authority on all things truthful, right? Like, where is this coming from? Show me your work. Show me the math. What is your experience that is so all-encompassing that you know this ultimate truth and I can only learn it from you? Did you have a near-death experience? Did you go into the light? Did you have a talk with God and Jesus and all the saints and they explained the meaning of life to you and they, they just put it all in your head so that you could come back and share it with the world? Well, how do you know this stuff? How do you know what the truth is? We're not here just to talk about your opinions. We're not here just to talk about your feelings and what you think about the world. We're actually here to arm you with principles. We want to arm you with principles. We aren't here to talk about your feelings or opinions. We're here for you to shut up and listen. Most of you don't know what distortion is. And you come into the group and you're spewing distortion all over people. It's coming out of you. It's being thrown on other people. And when one of us comes and says, hey, that's not helpful. You're in distortion. What do we get typically is like, I am not, which is actually the distortion that we're trying to help you see. Oh, you thought you had an educated opinion on something? You thought you knew yourself and your life and your personal, private, internal thoughts? Wrong. Distortion. Everything we don't agree with, distortion. Just spewing distortion all over everyone. This isn't about I'm perfect or I'm better. It has nothing to do with it kind of seems like that's exactly what you're saying. I am a humble, kind, loving human being, and so is Ruby, and so is everybody that is supporting this Connections movement. No, you're not. Connections means truth, and truth means principles. And so principles, I call them coming from God. You can call it whatever you'd like. I call it a word salad. Connections means truth, and truth means principles. Peanut butter means bread, and bread means jelly. Blue means yellow, and yellow means koala bear. We've been going along, and we've been, you know, putting up videos and answering questions. People get super reactionary. Have you noticed? Super reactionary. And we'll say something, and they're like, how dare you say that? You can't say that. That's not the truth. And, you know, it's, it, it is the truth. <laughs> but what they're saying is, I either am not willing, which is a principle, of, of distortion, which is called arrogance, which is called pride. Like, I'm not willing to even consider what you're saying. This is a funny statement because Jody claims that those who are not even willing to consider what she and Ruby are saying are in distortion. But then later she says she's just going to block people who don't agree with her. So how do we know you aren't in distortion, lady? Like, 
How do we know your if you if you know the truth and you're so set in it and so like concrete in it, how does it affect you negatively to have other people say things that don't align with your truth? Why do you need to block them? You're this all-knowing, all-encompassing being, right, that just has the truth, is the only one who has the truth, is the only one who could teach the truth, yet you get so triggered by people who don't agree with you. It sounds like you're in distortion. And as much as you say, I know, and, and you're wrong, and all that does is evidence like a neon sign around your name on the text thread that you're in distortion. So you can choose to be in distortion, and, and claim that you're speaking truth, but, but you're not because distortion can't be in the truth. So if it bothers you what you're hearing, we're not a good fit. Just recuse yourself, just leave, and, and that's fine. You can go live your life however you'd like. But if you are here because you see the chaos that's going on in the world, if you see that our children are being attacked, if you see that, that truth is being attacked, if you see that God's being attacked, if you see that um, people are engaging in, in lascivious and, and lewd and destructive and violent and aggressive and entitled and selfish behaviors and they don't have truth because you can't be doing that and live in truth. You cannot do that and live in truth. So I am not interested in getting into a tug of war around political issues. I am not interested. And what I am interested in is you. I am interested in you. I love you as a sister. I don't know your name, I don't know your face, but you're a child of God and therefore you are important. And if you are living in distortion, get out, get out of it. Let us help you. If you're doing your very best to live in truth, then learn more. Distortions in the schools, why? Because humans are coming into the schools with distortion. What does that mean? They're coming in with motives and agendas that are very selfish. Because that's, that's the base of distortion is selfishness. And then they wanna project it onto your kids. Now there's all sorts of issues that distortion is in. And here is the crux of Connexion's teachings. These other people out in the world, whether it be um, your loved ones, their friends, their teachers, anyone, they are causing chaos and bringing everyone away from the truth. You are under attack. Your children are under attack and you may feel isolated right now, but we're here for you. We understand you and the fears that swirl through your head at night and keep you awake. We will be your people. We will be your community. Stand with us and never be fooled by distortion again. Run away from the demons and evils of the world and walk into the warmth of our embrace. Bathe in the golden light of our truth. You have a place here. You're understood. You're welcomed here. We will keep you safe during this battle for your very soul and the souls of your children. Okay? This is the whole, like, center of this absolute dumpster fire. This is the source of the dumpster fire. Prey on people's insecurities. Prey on people's fears. And once you've stoked the flames of their fears into a forest fire that's unstoppable, you tell them that you're the only one who can put it out. Once again, I will bring your attention back to Lori Vello and Chad Daybell, Preparing a People, the Warrior Up podcast. Ruby and Jody aren't talking about compounds and tent cities and the end of the world yet, but it feels very much as if it could have easily gone in that direction. According to Ruby and Jody, the way to protect your kids is to basically torture them. Their parenting advice included taking away your children's Christmas presents as a punishment. Right, the, the punishment didn't fit the crime. And so I thought, how do I reach my kids in a way that they're going to understand? And it didn't make sense to me to hold my kids accountable, hold my kids accountable, and then Christmas come and then it's not consistent. And all of a sudden they get Santa Claus coming and pouring gifts upon them. And I thought this is an opportunity for me to really grab their attention. I can't think of anything that grabs a child's attention more than Santa Claus. And so I, I pulled them aside, my husband and I both. And we said, you know, we really love you. We r really truly love you. Like we're, we're not loving you just because you're cute and cuddly. <laughs> Although that's true. We love you and our responsibility is to help you reach 
a place of adulthood where you are empathic with others, where you really are a charactered being. And, and the information by your choices are telling your dad and I that you're not there. You're not even close. And so we're going to not be celebrating Christmas in the same way that we've done in the past. We're going to celebrate Christmas for what it really stands for, which is the Savior was born. And because the Savior was born, we get this beautiful opportunity to change. Our hearts get to soften. And so for Christmas, we're inviting you to soften your heart. And it was a beautiful experience. They really, really took to heart what we were inviting them to do. So Kevin and I stepped back and we watched how they took this outcome, how they interpreted it, how they worked with it, how they interacted with it. And because they're quite numb because of the choices they've been making, they didn't go into hysteria. They didn't go into fits. They didn't cry and scream. They just were like, okay. They weren't quite numb because of the choices they'd been making. They were quite numb because you've been emotionally and mentally abusing and neglecting them for so long that they reached a point of deactivation, of dissociation. They prefer to turn themselves off as a protective mechanism rather than leaving themselves open and vulnerable to be hurt and disappointed by you any longer. What's the one thing that kids love, right? That's what Ruby asks. What's the one thing kids love? Santa, what's the one thing we're going to take away from them to manipulate them, traumatize them, and make them feel small and insignificant? Santa. In their content, Ruby and Jody talked about how parents are not responsible for their children's well-being, happiness, or future. In fact, all they're responsible for is, you know, making their making their kids believe in God. That's what they said, making their kids believe in God. Based on recent events, I can safely say that this is dead on, right? Neither of these women felt responsible for the happiness or well-being of any of these kids. But I would also say that neither of these women understands anything about God. I'm not like a, a super religious person. I know a lot of people aren't. But people who are truly religious and who truly do believe in God and who follow, you know, what they believe to be the moral and correct way to live – they would not be treating their kids like this. Now, Ruby would also talk about how her kids don't deserve privacy or their own space. In this home, you don't get personal space because this is my space because I'm the parent. If you want your own personal space, you'll need to get your own space. This is mine. And as long as you're living in my home, it is my job to know everything about you. You don't get to sneak, you don't get to hide, you don't get to have secrets. Not in my house. Do you see how loving that is? Now, if you're in distortion, you're reeling right now. If you're in distortion, you're, you're, you're ready to, you're ready to pull your hair out right now. You're ready to scream. So think about how that feels in your system as you hear me say it. If a child is in truth, they won't have any problem with that. Okay. Got it. That makes sense. They're not going to have any, any, um, qualms about what I've just said. I wonder if she knows how childish and selfish and whiny and petulant she sounds. This is my space. This is my home. I let you live here. You know, it's disgusting. And and honestly, what she's saying is, I know that you thought you had a safe place to be where you could express yourself and be yourself, but that's false. That's wrong. This isn't your home. You're just residing here temporarily while I completely invade your space and privacy and make you feel like you have no rights or no rights to have boundaries in this house, which I will continually remind you does not belong to you, is not yours. You're a guest here, basically. But you're going to be treated like a housemaid. You're going to be treated like a housemaid. You're going to be treated like a prisoner at times. I don't know if Ruby Frankie has a mental illness. She's clearly incredibly delusional. She's clearly incredibly manipulative, which is something she admits to. If I can find the clip, I'll play it here. A masterful manipulator. I have manipulated using sex. I've manipulated using external rewards. I have wanted something and I'm going to get it no matter. She's not a good person and she's not doing good things. And check out this other clip, right? Because Ruby is such a controlling freaking weirdo a hot tub in my backyard and because it's in my home and it's on my property and I paid for it, it's under my jurisdiction. I have stewardship over that hot tub. And so I get to decide the types of bathing suits people wear when they're in that hot tub. 
I don't get to go to the city pool and decide that. I don't get to walk around and say, um, that's not appropriate. I don't want that swimming suit. I don't get to do that because it's public property. It's a public pool. I do get to decide what comes into my home. And I have decided there's no bikinis. And so if someone comes over with a bikini, they are invited to put on something else or to leave. Okay, let's talk about the arrests because at this point in the video, I am really needing the villains of this movie to face some sort of retribution. You know, have you ever watched a movie where like, and I always identify with the bad guy and I'm like, oh, there's reasons. Like, I, this is just a more interesting character for me usually in a movie, but this isn't a movie, it's real life. But do you know how when you're watching a movie and the bad guy just like keeps getting away with things and the good guy like keeps getting thwarted and you're like, okay, come on now. Like, I need, I need to see the bad guy, like, at least have some roadblock here for me to continue watching this movie. That's how I feel by this point in the video because I cannot stand these two women. I think that um, what they deserve is more than jail time. They deserve a serious, uh, a serious beat down, honestly. So on August 30th, 2023, both Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildebrandt were arrested at their respective homes. Ruby was arrested at her home in Springville, Utah, and Jody at her home in Ivan's, Utah. Now, according to the probable cause affidavit, Ruby's 12-year-old son, Russell, escaped Jody's house through a window and then ran to a neighbor's house where he asked for food and water. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. And he's a uh said he had just came from a neighbor's house, and we know there's been problems at this neighbor's house. He's emaciated, he's got tape around his legs, he's hungry, and he's thirsty. Okay. Is, he, is your door locked? No, I'm sitting outside with him on the, on the front patio. Okay, cool. And he asked us to call the police. What's so he's very afraid. Okay, and um, is are the neighbors out of their home, or is anybody looking for them that you can see? Uh, no. We are homes are far enough away. Uh, I'm not sure. How did you get out of the house? Uh, Orange. Give it out. He says he just left through the porch at the neighbor's house. Um, her name is Jody Hildebrand, and she lives two doors up the street. Yeah, out here in Cayenne, the houses are far apart, so he walked just under the block to get to our house. He, he rang my doorbell and asked me to call the police. <laughs> I don't think he needs an ambulance. I'll let the cops decide that, but his ankles are taped up, and he won't tell us why. Okay. But he has duct tape around each ankle. Yeah, there's sores around them. I think the a good chance he's been. Uh... He also said. Oh, and he has them around his ankles. I mean his wrists as well. Okay, this boy has been. <laughs> he needs. <laughs> this kid has obviously been. I think he's been. He's been detained. He's been. He's obviously covered in wounds. Yeah, I'm sure that that doesn't matter, son. Do you know who your mom and dad are? Well, actually, I don't know where my mom is, but I do know where my dad is. He's not anywhere here. No, 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 nowhere. Okay. No, he doesn't seem to. He says he knows where his mom is, but uh, he doesn't know where his dad is. That's correct. Is his mom home? He doesn't live. He just says he doesn't live around he's here. Okay. And is your mom around here? Have you seen her lately? He doesn't know where she is right now. Okay. He's hungry and uh, like the young man. He's had, he's here in his stocking feet. Uh, so he he escaped. Okay. Jody Hildebrand is up there right now. Okay. So she may come looking for him here soon, but uh, he's not going to, obviously. All right, we need the cops here as soon as possible. I'm just asking where he is now. Yeah, she's a, uh, 
She's a bad lady. We didn't realize how bad. First of all, this guy is clearly living deep in distortion. This neighbor guy? distortion. Now, let me give you some context for the area that Jody lived in before we discuss the call. Jody's house is located in Ivan's within a vast remote area less than a mile south of the Red Mountain Wilderness. Hers is only one of the three finished homes in the low-density neighborhood of Taugu Court, which is why you heard that gentleman who's clearly in distortion say that Russell had to walk a block in his socks to get from Jody's house to the home of this neighbor. So this man also was very evidently disturbed and emotionally upset when he saw the state that Russell was in. He referred to Russell as being emaciated, hungry, thirsty, with wounds all over his body and duct tape on his wrists and ankles, stating that the boy had clearly been detained. (laughs) That's exactly what a disrupted individual would say, am I right? Upon arriving, law enforcement observed Russell's wounds and malnourishment to be severe, and the 12-year-old boy was transferred to St. George Regional Hospital and placed on a medical hold due to his deep lacerations from being tied up and also from his malnourishment. A second child aged 10, who I believe to be Eve, was also found in Jody's home, and doctors at the hospital determined that she was also malnourished, but it didn't appear she was being um, held. She wasn't, like, at, at least in that moment, she wasn't tied up. She didn't have duct tape on her arms and legs. She just wasn't being fed properly. When I say just wasn't being fed properly, as if that's, like, not nothing, but it's it's huge. It's huge, especially when a child is growing up. Like, their development long-term depends on them getting proper nutrition during the formidable years of childhood. So... It's pretty bad. So during the search of Jody's house, police discovered what has been referred to as a panic room underneath her garage. The police have also revealed that they believe Ruby Frankie was aware of what was happening to her two children while in the care of Jody because she'd been at Jody's house the Monday before, at which time these two delusional women had filmed a YouTube video together. I definitely believe she was aware of what was happening. She brought them there and apparently seemed to be leaving them there long term, almost as if Jody was like, oh, let me counsel your children. And when I give them back to you, they're going to be in tip top ship shape form, you know. And so Ruby left her kids at Jody's house and then went home. And I do believe she 100% knew what was happening to her kids. And this isn't the only reason I think this, but it's it's part of the reason. Because when Ruby was arrested, she asked for a lawyer and she refused to speak to law enforcement. And that seems to be an odd thing to do. And I know like everybody, when they're getting arrested, should ask for a lawyer and shouldn't talk to the police. I understand that. But if you're innocent, and not only innocent, but you are now told that your children are being abused and not fed by Jody Hildebrandt, Maybe you wouldn't, like, shut down and not talk to the police. You'd, you'd be stunned, right? If you had no idea this was going on, you'd be stunned and concerned about your kids. You wouldn't clam up and call a lawyer. Ruby and Jody have been charged with six counts of aggravated child abuse each, and these charges allege that the two women jeopardized the life of these kids and or caused severe emotional harm in uh, multiple ways, right? A combination of physical torture through starvation or malnutrition is what the arrest affidavit lists. And each count carries a sentence of one to 15 years in prison. And for some reason... <laughs> In these screenshots from their virtual hearings, both Ruby and Jody are looking up to the sky. I guess they're hoping that God or the truth with a capital T will float down and save them. (laughs) Keep looking. Keep looking up, guys. Keep it up. Both Ruby and Jody have been ordered to be held without bond, and their attorneys have filed motions for an expedited detention hearing, believing that both cases should be heard at the same time. Which, once again, is another reason why I believe Ruby knew exactly what was going on, because if she wants to be tried with Jody, or if she wants to be in front of a judge with Jody, this is not somebody she's looking at necessarily as, like, an enemy or somebody who hurt her kids. It's somebody that she's looking at as an ally and and who she's going to be loyal to, and they're going to face this head on together. Since the arrests, authorities have revealed that they have responded to the Frankie home multiple times over the past few years, and two of these occasions was regarding the welfare of Ruby's children. On April 16th, 2022, a caseworker from CPS called the police and said that two children were running unsupervised in the streets near the Frankie home. A police officer drove over there but did not observe this, did not 
see kids running around in the street. However, it was well known that Ruby had removed her two younger children from school, claiming that they were being homeschooled. But neighbors often reported seeing Eve wandering the neighborhood, looking for friends to play with. People said she would knock on their doors, ask if their children could play. And when she was told that the kids wouldn't be home from school for like another three to four hours, she would tell the neighbors, OK, I'll wait. On September 18th, 2022, the oldest Frankie sibling, Sherry, had called the police and asked them to perform a welfare check on her younger siblings. She claimed that their mother, Ruby, had left them alone at home for five days, and Sherry wanted to make sure they had enough food for this extended period of time. When the police arrived to the Frankie residence, no one answered the door, but they said they saw the children through the window in the living room, and they saw the kids got on the phone with someone, and then they went upstairs, and they, like, wouldn't answer the door. When talking Talking to the neighbors, police discovered that Ruby Frankie had been acting very weird since early 2022, more weird than usual, I guess. She started taping paper over all of her windows in her house. She was getting involved in her neighbors' lives and lecturing them, wagging her finger at one man in the neighborhood who had pictures of women in shorts hanging in his garage. And Ruby had been disappearing quite a bit, leaving her young children home alone, sometimes for weeks. One neighbor told the police, listen, check my cameras, like my surveillance cameras, my house and you'll see Ruby's car hasn't been in her driveway for five days. And another claimed that Ruby at that time was at the home of Jody Hildebrand because one of their friends who lived near Jody and Ivan's had seen Ruby's car parked at Jody's house. So Ruby was leaving her kids at home in Springville and driving to Ivan's to like hang out with Jody and leaving her kids home alone. And this makes me wonder, while these kids are home alone, you know, age 12 and 10, for a week, weeks at a time, were they doing things like leaving the house a mess or eating too much food or whatever that Ruby would come home and discover, you know, maybe there was like something sticky on the floor and she licked it and then shot up like a lizard all pissed off. And she's like, I can't believe I can't even leave you guys home alone for two weeks without you making a mess. And then she told Jody, and she's like, these freaking kids, man, they're trying to eat food while I'm gone. <laughs> They're not, like, cleaning the toilets while I'm gone. They're roaming the neighborhood looking for social interaction while I'm gone. Like, it's it's out of control. And Jody was like, you're right. This sounds like a real big problem, man. They're going down the wrong path. Why don't you bring them to my house for a couple of days? And uh, I'll do the old Jody Hildebrandt method, you know, tape them up tie them up, keep them trapped, and not feed them. And then we'll see. We'll see how many toilets they don't want to scrub, you know? Maybe that's what happened here, because at first it seemed Ruby was leaving her kids at home to go hang out with Jody, and then it seemed Ruby was bringing the kids to Jody's and then leaving and going back home. So what's that about? The police report stated, quote, everyone who came to the scene was very concerned about the children and them being left home alone. They expressed a great concern about the two youngest children being homeschooled while the two older ones go to public school, mostly because it shows they are home alone during the day by themselves and there isn't any way for them to contact emergency services if needed, end quote. Now, Sherry Frankie, the oldest daughter, spoke about this situation in April during a podcast interview, and she claimed she'd cut ties with her family after they became involved with Connections. And after hearing about her mother's arrest, Sherry took to Instagram to say, finally. And then she wrote, quote, today has been a big day. Me and my family are so glad justice is being served. We've been trying to tell the police and CPS for years about this and so glad they finally decided to step up. End quote. Now, Ruby's estranged husband, Kevin Frankie, has not been arrested, and his lawyer, Randy Kester, appeared on Good Morning America on September 6th to say that his client had played no role in any abuse or neglect and, quote, he's a good person, he's very gentle, and no one's ever made any allegations that he's ever physically abused those kids or anyone else. He just wants to do what's best for his kids, get them back, get them under his tutelage and his fathership, and protect them, end quote. I'm not going to say too much about my opinion of Kevin Frankie at this moment because it seems that in a way he also became a victim of Ruby Frankie, Jody Hildebrandt, and Connections. And I don't know all of the context and I don't know everything that he did or didn't do. So I'm not going to share with you my gut instinct about Kevin Frankie in the effort to be unbiased and not jump to conclusions. It's very hard for me to not tell you how I'm feeling right now. But when Ruby Frankie appeared in court this past Thursday, the plot thickened as if it could, but it did. In front of a public courtroom filled with a bunch of strangers, Ruby 
crying during a shelter hearing for her four minor children, claimed that two of her children were basically sexual abusers. She said that one of her children um, had been looking at pornography since he was three, and then he began abusing his younger sibling until eventually they both began abusing others. Now, she doesn't use their names, but she's talking about one of her sons looking at pornography since he's three and then abusing his younger sibling. I wonder if she's referring to Russell and Eve because these are the two children that were involved in the abuse. So is she trying to blame them? Is she trying to say that because they were doing this stuff, that's why she and Jody had to tie them up with the duct tape and starve them? I, I don't know what's happening here. But once again... This is Lori Vallow to a T. This is something that Lori Vallow would do, right? She didn't claim that her children, Tylee and JJ, were doing these things. She claimed they were demons, right? They were – their bodies were inhabited by ancient demons. um, And, and, you know, she was – they had to go, basically. They had to go because of the demons inside of them, which is not really much different. And that's what I mean, like – I think that this this whole connections thing, this whole Ruby and Jody thing could have turned into another Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell situation very easily. So I'm glad that law enforcement got involved early this time. So Ruby claimed that her son had confessed to her in May that he'd abused 20 people. Um, some of these were neighbors, cousins, family members, etc. And then reportedly, in another twist, a lawyer sitting in the courtroom stood up and asked the judge to hear details about the abuse of a child whose mother was also present in the courtroom. But the judge denied this request, stating that details of this alleged abuse could be heard at another time. And once again, like, is this lawyer and whatever person they claim to be representing part of this Connections group? Kind of like how everyone in that Preparing a People group with Chad and Lori kind of like went along with what they wanted for so long and and just kind of believed them blindly and, and at times tried to help them get out of trouble and lied. Is that what is happening here? Because since this happened, the niece of Jody Hildebrandt has come out and claimed that she does not believe what Ruby is saying about her kids because she has suffered from lifelong abuse at the hands of her aunt, Jody Hildebrandt. And she was also forced to make up stories and confess to things that she had done in order to get a break from the constant torture. Yeah, I was I was left in her care when I was a teenager um, for a little under a year. Have you met Ruby before? No, I um, I've never met Ruby. I don't I've this is the first time I've ever been heard of her. I have gone and watched um, at least some of her videos. They're, they're very difficult to watch just for my own um, my own experience with that form of therapy or therapy. Um, it's it's quite triggering, to be honest. Um, so I've never met her, um, but the things that she is saying and regurgitating are very very familiar to me. Um, it's interesting to watch the i mean i and i understand this but it's interesting to watch the world respond to her and kind of putting her as at the forefront and i understand that she's the mother of these children and and it makes sense but the philosophies and the therapeutic modalities that she's using are jody's and these are these are not new these are not um this this is a pattern that jody has been um, engaged with for at least 14 years um I don't know if there are other people that she's used these on, but she's definitely taught. I know that she teaches parents to use these types of um, therapies, as she as she would call them. Um, so yeah, it's been a it's been a really interesting experience watching everyone focus on Ruby, and I understand why. But this is Jody. These are Jody's words. These are Jody's ideas. These have are over decades old. So yeah. Is that why you've called Jody the mastermind behind all of this? Yes, um, that doesn't excuse Ruby's involvement and her pe- perpetuating these these beliefs and these systems. But Ruby didn't come up with this. Um, Ruby um, obviously supports it and um, has used these on her children. Um, but this is coming from Jody. In short, can you describe what you mean? Like which practices are you talking about? Just to make sure we're clear, because I know there's a lot out there. So which ones are you talking about that that you've seen, that you're hearing about pertaining to her children that you're familiar with too? Sure, yeah. Um, So 
the things that I experienced while living with Jody, I experienced being tied. I experienced being duct taped. I experienced being blindfolded. I experienced uh, severe isolation. I experienced severe emotional, spiritual, and psychological abuse. I experienced um, the being told I, I I shouldn't be around other people, being told that I was dangerous to be around. Um, I was people were afraid of me to the point where I was afraid of myself. Um, I was physically, I was, I was forced to sleep outside in the snow. I was, um, like I said, isolated for up to 12 hours a day. Um, if I, if someone wanted, if someone spoke to me directly, if I wasn't wearing duct tape on my mouth, um, I had to just stare at them and not respond because she also had systems of people that would respond report back to her if I broke any of these rules. Um, and her whole thing, which is deeply, darkly ironic, is that everything is stems from shame and how, how horrible shame is. And that all of the reason, like all of mental illness, all um, tics, so like OCDs, addiction, everything stems from shame, um, which is just horrifying because she is the greatest uh, perpetuator of shame. Um, she also, and this is like a, a very deep connection and why I chose to come forward to the media rather than just staying with the podcast. Um, she accused me of being a sex addict. She accused me of being uh, addicted to masturbation to the point where I wasn't allowed to, I, I mentioned this on the podcast, to the point where I wasn't allowed to use tampons. Um, I never was allowed privacy unless I was isolated. So that included the bathroom. I was never allowed to have the door closed because she was convinced that I was just constantly masturbating. She was convinced that I was addicted to porn. Um, I had never seen porn at that point in my life. I, I'd never, I didn't even know that people with <laughs> my anatomy could masturbate. Like I, I had no idea any of this stuff, but I just believed her because she, everything like one, she used religion and God as a mode of control um, and a, a mode to manipulate. And so I just believed all of these things. So her ability to convince you of these uh, neuroticisms and um, these behaviors is, and I was a teenager. And so a child in that position of being told this over and over and over and over again, which I'm certain he was, um, stood no chance. She wanted to make my life, and this is like her quote, like this is what she would tell me all of the time. She wanted to make my life so uncomfortable that it would force the sin out, that it would force me to confess. So things continuously got worse and worse and progressively more and more intense as a way to get me to confess because she believed that if I had confessed everything, if every all of my sins were out and in the open, that I would be getting better. And I was declining like very fast, exponentially. And um, so she just kept ramping it up. And so to hear Ruby tell the world that her child is a sex addict, a predator, and has been addicted to porn since he was three years old, it just echoes exactly the things that she was telling me and telling everyone around me. Um, and I know that I, I've, I've, I think if I got, I don't know if I got this right, but I'm pretty sure that she's saying that he even confessed to it. Well, I also confessed to things that I didn't do as a way of trying to get the abuse to stop. Because when you, when she's like drilling it into you both psychologically and physically that there's more and it will stop once you tell her, because that's what, that's what she would tell you. Like in the middle of the abuse, she'd be like, I'll stop as soon as you tell me. Because the, the thing that's so sinister about this is that it can't be disproven. So even if nothing, even if like she goes to prison, you know, he is, his name is cleared, it will never be fully cleared because it cannot be disproven. So this is going to potentially follow him for the rest of his life. So even with those children being taken out of her care, she is still abusing them. So this young woman seems to believe that her Aunt Jody is the mastermind and Ruby is following along. And I mean, maybe, maybe that could be. 
Jody could be the stronger personality, but I tend to believe that this is what happens when two psychopaths meet each other. We saw it with Ken Bernardo and Carla Homoka. We saw it with Ian Brady, Myra Hindley, Henry Lee Lucas, and Otis Toole. You have two twisted people who have gone their whole lives feeling that their dark desires could never be found or understood by another human being. And maybe they felt like they were completely alone in the world as to what kind of weird ass things were going on in their head. And then they meet someone who's just as messed up as they are. And it's an immediate bond, a trauma bond, an immediate recognition like the screwed up version of a soulmate. We can clearly see that Ruby Frankie always had distorted views on what it meant to be a parent, what it meant to raise healthy and happy kids. So she probably just felt at home and comfortable within Jody's Connexion classroom, within Connexion's teachings. This was probably like coming home to her. Some of Kevin Frankie's family members have emerged giving their own perspective on Ruby and what has happened. Uh, her sisters-in-law, Cynthia and Jennifer Frankie, have claimed they are shocked and sickened with the abuse allegations against Ruby. They've said she's a narcissist who always thought she was better than everyone else. They believe that Ruby and Kevin started going to Jody Hildebrandt for marriage counseling, and they also have referred to Jody's company as a cult, saying, quote, Kevin was in a men's group at Connexions. He he had a checklist of what he needed to do to be better, and if you did, they would praise you, and if you didn't, they would chastise you, end quote. They had also heard that Jody moved into the Frankie home in Springville before Kevin moved out between 2021 and 2022, and one of the first things that Jody did when she was there was drive a wedge between the couple. Jennifer Frankie said, quote, Ruby was living on one side of the house and Kevin was living on the other. Kevin couldn't talk to Ruby unless Jody was present, end quote. They also say that Kevin moved out in July of 2022 and he lived in a townhouse nearby where he had a minder from Connexions who would live with him and keep an eye on him. Sounds like a cult. <laughs> Ruby's own sisters, who also happen to be family and lifestyle influencers, they've stated that they believe Ruby's arrest needed to happen. Ali Meacham, Bonnie Hoellen, and Julie Duru released a joint statement which said, quote, For the last three years, we've kept quiet on the subject of Ruby Frankie for the sake of her children. Behind the public scene, we've done everything to try and make sure the kids were safe. We wouldn't feel right about moving forward with our regular content without addressing the most recent events. Once we do, we will not be commenting on it any further, end quote. Now, now that we've addressed it, we can continue on with our regularly scheduled content and we won't be addressing this anymore. Okay. Okay, accountability. A bunch of other people have come out who have gotten therapy or counseling from Jody Hildebrandt and have said similar things, that they were basically tortured, that they were um, isolated from their family members. Um, men have come forward and said that they were made to feel bad or wrong. Basically, they had to be completely isolated from their families because of these bad things that they were doing. One man was told by Jody um, that because he did a double take when he was walking past a woman on the street, like he had looked at her and then looked back at her because he thought she was attractive, that he was just like completely evil and bad and wrong and, and had to be punished for this. So yes, quite drastic. And now it looks like yesterday, the lawyer for Kevin Frankie has placed basically all the responsibility for these child abuse allegations on Jody Hildebrandt. So according to this article from Law and Crime, Ruby Frankie allegedly told Kevin Frankie that they needed to work on their marriage, but things would be better if he wasn't in the home and he wasn't communicating with his children. When asked what the catalyst was for the separation, Randy Kester, who's Kevin's lawyer, said it was private and would only reveal that if they had a difference of opinion about their family parenting. Which means like if Ruby comes out and starts to blame Kevin for anything or say he was also involved, that's when Kevin will reveal the reason for their separation. According to Randy Kester, Ruby Frankie knew the police were coming to arrest her after her two children were found in serious condition at the Hildebrand home on August 30th. Kevin Frankie allegedly told his attorney that Ruby texted him saying there was an emergency. When he texted back to say he was working, Ruby responded that she needed to speak with him immediately. When they spoke on the phone, Ruby allegedly told Kevin that he would need to take care of the kids. Kester claims that Kevin Frankie didn't know that Ruby had moved the children to Ivan's Utah about four hours 
hours away from Salt Lake City. He said, quote, if you read everything that's in the media, Kevin's getting raked over the coals. But what people don't understand is that he was trying to preserve his marriage. He was taking direction from her. She's the one who asked him to leave the house and indicated that in order for him to be able to get back together with her and be a family, that she was requesting that he leave the home and that he not contact her or the children. She later told him that everything was blissful at home and it was much better without him. Emotionally, she was controlling him because she knew how much he valued their marriage and valued their family, and it was his desire to be able to get back with the family and preserve his marriage. Kevin never had any reason to believe that his children were being abused, and if he even had one inkling that his kids were being abused and that the separation wasn't for any other purpose than to figure out a way between he and Ruby to reunite their family, he would have been down there in two seconds. End quote. So Kevin also said that the dynamic between Kevin and Ruby changed dramatically and completely after Ruby partnered up with Jody Hildebrandt. Randy Kester said that Kevin told him that Jody manipulated him in conjunction with Ruby and that Jody is kind of the spearhead toward essentially destroying his life and destroying his family. We're hearing other information that she's done this to a number of families and it wasn't until all this came to light that Kevin came to realize that his family had been victimized by Jody. So that's kind of where we are at this moment. Ruby and Jody are behind bars. Uh, Kevin's trying to get custody of his two youngest children, claiming he had no idea this was happening at all, even though we know that he was aware of what Ruby was doing to the kids for years and years because we were all aware of it, right? Because it was on YouTube. So at least we know that much. He knew, he knew what was going on during that time, and the fact that he didn't see any red flags with that or didn't try to put a stop to it lets me know that he also thought that was probably just fine to happen, and that's a problem for me. But like I said, I'm not going to talk about Kevin anymore. I cannot do it. So I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if Jody and Ruby are going to turn on each other. I feel that eventually Ruby probably will because she is manipulative, because she is not humble, because she is not somebody who clearly has any capability of taking accountability for herself. So once she sees that everyone's coming out and piling on Jody Hildebrandt, um, like her niece and past patients and even – um, her, you know, Ruby's own husband, Kevin, and Kevin's lawyer, she may be like, okay, this is my out. This is the way. But hopefully whatever trial happens will still end with Ruby facing the consequences for what she's done to her children or what she's allowed somebody else to do to her children. Because at the end of the day, these, you know, six counts of child abuse and neglect that she faces, they not only state that, you know, these charges are being put on her because of what she potentially did to her own children, but also because she placed her children with somebody that she knew would abuse them or harm them or malnourish them. So I do believe that the law is on our side here with this one, and hopefully she will face justice for what happened, and hopefully she will um, never be allowed to be around young children again, honestly. So that's all we have for today, but we still do have our Small Business Showcase. Stephanie's Small Business Showcase, woohoo! So we're going to do that really quick. Today's Small Business Showcase is brought to us from Brewery Boxes, a small business in Arizona started by Stevie Blackman that offers creatively designed chocolate-covered strawberries, cake pops, cupcakes, cookies, chocolate pretzels, and more. Have I ever told you how much I love cake pops? A lot, like really a lot. I love them. So the stuff on Brewery Boxes is so cute, and it looks delicious as well, but it also seems like they can do all sorts of designs and themes, which would be great for birthday parties, showers, what have you. There's bridal-designed chocolate-dipped strawberries, Toy Story chocolate-dipped pretzels. I even saw these awesome cake pops that have, like, Pokemon and Gudetama on them. So it seems that whatever you need, Brewery Boxes can deliver, and I would love that Pikachu cake pop in my mouth right now. So I've linked their website in in the description box. Make sure you check them out for your next party, your next event. Give them some love. Thank you everybody so much for being here. Make sure you like this video if you liked it. Share it if you think it's worth sharing. A comment and let me know what you think about this case, where you're at with it. I'm sure we're going to have some lively discussions in the comment section and I can't wait to be a part of that. So until next time, stay kind, stay beautiful, and stay safe. And I'll see you very, very soon. Bye. Straight down, and that river runs deep. The mouths get steep, and the voice is getting too loud. For this feelings I very it's looking like a cemetery. They're going back from the grave, calling out my name. Better say you help me. But you don't know how deep it goes until it's getting you slowly. And so you got to let it go. 
I got blood, blood on the strings. 